Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Melisande and it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to our fourth talk of our AI Helps Ukraine conference. We are very excited to welcome two wonderful speakers today, Professor Imbal becker rishev and Professor Hannah Kerner from NASA Harvest, NASA's Applied Science Program on Food Security and Agriculture, and they will talk about AI and Earth observation for global agricultural monitoring and food security. Um, but before moving to the talk, we would like to take a couple of minutes to briefly introduce the char um, charity conference AI Helps Ukraine. Hi, Alexi. Hi, Mary. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexi. I'm a member of the organization team of this conference here at Mila, and I would like to take some time to briefly introduce our um, conference. AI Helps Ukraine is a student-led fundraising conference in AI. And our aim is to bring together the leading experts uh, in the field of AI to raise funds uh, for humanitarian help for Ukraine. Uh, we are hosting a series of online talks throughout the months of November and December. Additionally, we will host a full day in-person event on the 8th of December here at Mila. And we would like to warmly invite you all to join this in-person event if you can, if you're around in Montreal. So it's been nine months uh, since the Russian invasion in Ukraine and the level of death, destruction and suffering uh, inflicted on the civilian population is beyond any comprehension. No one in Ukraine is left uh, unaffected by this war. There are just normal people like you and me who were living their normal lives, uh, bringing kids to school, going to their offices to work, meeting friends in cafes, having their normal lives until the 24th of February of this year. So within nine months, um, around 13 million people have been forced to leave their homes. And estimated of 18 million people will need humanitarian aid. And the Ukrainian Ministry of Health estimates that 15 million people were, will require psychological support. More than 15,000 civilians have been killed or injured. Um, here, for example, you can see some pictures from the Kyiv region. So the upper picture is a picture of the uh, district where I, where I personally grew up. It's just in front of this bombarded building where I had many friends going to the school that's just in front of this building. And this is where I also learned to play basketball. Additionally, critical civil infrastructure is a common target of Russian attacks. The Russian army clearly intends to undermine industrial production, disrupt transportation, spread fear, and deprive the civilian population of heat, electricity, water supplies just before the winter. Hundreds of thousands of people lack food, water, heat, electricity, and medical care. For this reason, we are insistently reminding you to support our cause through your donation. Um, okay. <clears throat> yes. So your donations will be used to purchase devices like this. I hope that slide comes back. You can go on. So the device you just saw on your screen, that's a negative pressure one therapy device. And this kind of devices are especially needed for um, uh, healing injuries uh, that people get from missiles, which is unfortunately still happening a lot these days. Um, I would especially uh, like to highlight that it's not important how much you donate. The only thing that really matters is that you do not become in indifferent. So the biggest power is uh, unity. And our team strongly believes that the collective effort of our broad international community can make the real difference for those in need. And this difference can become broader with every donation and with every retweet of our social media posts. Last but not least, uh, we would like to especially thank to our partners, uh, Mila Quebec AI Institute, who kindly um, who are helping us with the logistics around the venue, as well as the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian medical support. It's a Canadian Canadian nonprofit organization who helps us with the logistics around the donation and uh, humanitarian aid. Um, and also a big thank to our first uh, corporate partner, which is Google uh, Montreal. So with this, I would like to give uh, a word to Melisande, who will introduce our today's speakers. Yeah, thank you, Alexi. So we're about to get started, uh, and we can't wait to hear from uh, both of you, Hannah and Inbal. 
Um, but let me first uh, quickly mention is welcome to use the Crowdcast chat during the presentation for the discussion. You can find like the chat on the uh, right side of your screen. And uh, you're very welcome to discuss, uh, comment, and share relevant papers during the talk. And you can also use the Q&A feature, which is the bubble with a little question mark, to ask your questions to the speaker for the discussion time after the talk. You can also upvote the questions of others. Um, now, the organizing team of AI Helps Ukraine is deeply committed to making this virtual conference an inclusive and safe space for everyone. So we kindly ask you to actively help us with this. We have a code of conduct, which is available on our, on our website. And according to it, and to keep things uh, nice for everyone, any hate speech or harmful comments will not be tolerated. Now, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. Inval becker Rashev. She is the director of NASA Harvest and a research professor at the University of Maryland. Her work is focused on the applications of Earth observations for agricultural monitoring from the field to global scales to support decisions in food security, sustainability, and agricultural markets. Dr. Hannah Kerner is joining us today as well. And she's an assistant professor at the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence at Arizona State University. And she's also the machine learning lead and US domestic co-lead for the NASA Harvest program and is responsible for deploying research methods in real operations for stakeholders in industry, government, and humanitarian organizations. So Enval and Hannah, both of you have received a long list of awards and prizes that I'm not going to detail here for your impactful work. But I'm really excited about your talk because the challenges that you're tackling around agriculture and food security are really among the critical issues of our time. And your work also resonates with our cause as you will talk about AI and earth observations to rapidly respond to critical events impact to global agriculture and food security, including the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war. So Enbal and Hannah, thank you so much for being here with us. We're so honored to have you and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will start sharing my screen here. All right. So um, today, the title of our talk that's going to be given by both myself and Dr. Inbal becker is AI and Earth Observations for Global Agricultural Monitoring and Food Security. So in this talk, we're going to be talking about um, what NASA Harvest is, this program that Melisande mentioned in the introduction. Um, I'll talk a bit about how we're using AI and Earth observations for rapidly responding to events that are impacting global agriculture and food security. And then Inval will also tell you about a project that uh, Harvest has ongoing right now to use these methods to uh, help create estimates of agricultural production and other variables um, to understand how the Russian invasion of Ukraine is helping or is uh, impacting food security and agricultural production. Uh, just a little thing, uh, Hannah, I think we can't see uh, the, the slides. Really? Can you start, uh, uh, can you try sharing again? Okay, I see them in my view of... I, I can see them too, Melissa. Well, okay, well, maybe it's just me. Oh, in volume, you don't see them. I don't, I don't see that, I see a black screen. Weird. Okay, let me try again. Okay, how about now? No? I don't know if it's just on my side. I see a black. My view. Does anybody else see them? I mean, they need to reload. It looks good. I think you can go okay. ahead. But in all, you can't see them? I can't see them, but I'll look at them on my screen and hopefully I say next. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is odd. Okay. Um, anyway, so Inval is going to be talking about, um, about the NASA Harvest program. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Inval. Great, good. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. We are really honored and excited to, to be here and to talk about our work under NASA Harvest. 
But first, to provide some context for our work, as we all know, or most of us know, we're only getting further and further away from the sustainable development goal of zero hunger. And food security remains one of the most pressing issues that we face today. Our global food systems and food security are at a critical point. According to the 2022 Global Report on Food Crisis um, that was released by the World Food Program in May, the number of people facing acute food insecurity shot up by nearly 60 million people in between 2019 and 2021, with currently about 55 countries in dire need of assistance and about 40 million people across 36 countries on the verge of famine. And so the invasion of Ukraine, the pandemic, and increasingly frequent and severe weather events are highlighting just how fragile and interconnected our food system is. And therefore, innovation in developing robust and scalable measures to monitor the world's crops, that is, in a timely way, in a transparent manner, is absolutely critical in terms of being able to help us to address this global challenge. Next. And so if we just take a look at this year alone, we saw a drought that impacted crops in, in the U.S. wheat belt, and currently also in parts of the Corn Belt, a heat wave that damaged crops in India, unprecedented heat and drought that significantly reduced corn production across major growing regions in Europe, dry conditions that impacted corn and soybeans in Brazil and Argentina, crop failure due to droughts across parts of North Africa and the Middle East, and a fourth consecutive drought in the Horn of Africa and likely going into a fifth consecutive season um, of, of drought that is leading to catastrophic food insecurity. Next. And so in this context of increasing food insecurity under a warming climate, NASA launched its global food security and agriculture program that's called NASA Harvest in 2017. This program sits within the applied sciences program at NASA and under Harvest, our primary mission is to enable and advance the adoption of satellite data in order to benefit food security, agriculture and sustainability across the globe, ultimately helping to bridge gaps between scientific findings and practical application. And it's a unique program for NASA because it's run out of a university and implemented as a consortium with over 50 partners across the agricultural sector. And as you'll hear in this talk from uh, both Hannah and I, we're very much driven by stakeholders and end user needs. And this is absolutely key to the success of, of Harvest. Next. Um, are you on the slide now with the satellite? Yeah, the globe. Data? Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so some of you may be wondering, what does NASA have to do with agriculture? You might associate NASA with space exploration. Um, but in fact, the earliest Earth observing satellites were actually designed with agriculture as a key application area. And so we have satellites passing over us um, all the time, collecting a lot of different kinds of information about the Earth's surface, about the air above it, and in wavelengths of light, both what we can see with the human eye, but many wavelengths beyond what we can see with the human eye. And these kind of data are really, really important for us to be able to monitor through space and time uh, what's happening on the ground. They provide us with data that are timely, that are objective, that are repeatable, that are scalable, and with long, dense records that enable us to monitor our diverse agricultural landscapes across the globe. And with the recent advances, both in satellite systems on the commercial side and on the public side, with advances in cloud computing, with machine learning and AI advances, and with GPS technology, we have the data today to monitor and track every field across the globe on a near daily basis. Next. And so in terms of our approach, almost every one of our activities starts with our stakeholders and with our end users to ensure that our work can be most effectively transformed into actionable information that ultimately helps to inform decisions. And um, with that, I'd like to pass it over to, to Hannah, or sorry, I've got one more slide actually. Um, but, and Hannah will talk and emphasize quite a lot on that. And so we're, just to give you some context, we're organized around a number of different initiatives that are listed here. We have over 35 different active projects. And today, Hannah and I are gonna focus in on two key and very related areas, one on our um, AI and machine learning, and the other is on rapid action for policy support. And with that, I'll pass it over to, uh, to Hannah, who's the machine learning and, and AI lead for NASA Artist. Thank you. Um, okay, so talking about how we're using AI and Earth observations to respond to these uh, rapid response efforts within NASA Harvest, um, first I wanted to kind of take a step back and um, talk about, you know, why I became interested in AI or really computer science in the first place. 
I think we hear probably in this conference, there's been a lot of um, talks that are focused on the more foundational side, um, which is really important. But really the reason that I got interested in doing AI research in the first place um, and why it's such a big part of the Harvest organization is because there is huge potential for AI to help solve grand challenges that society is facing today. Like how can we support our growing population and the quality of life without exceeding the resource budget of our planet, which we typically refer to as sustainable development. And we have the 17 UN sustainable development goals around this as well. Um, how can we as a society adapt to climate change and mitigate climate change, for example, through our food system? Um, how do we create a more equitable society and ensure technology is benefiting everyone? And even, you know, stepping way back, are we alone in this universe? There's so many um, important questions that um, AI has the potential for helping to address if we're focusing on creating technologies that are really relevant to these real world problems. Um, and so satellite and other earth observation data are critical data sets for addressing these problems with AI. But today we've hardly scratched the surface of what we can do with AI and earth observations. And there's a huge amount of excitement around these relatively new types of data sets as Zenba was showing you know, we've there's been a lot of um, changes in new types of sensors and data that we have available from Earth observations. Um, and with this excitement, I think uh, Earth observations is already starting to become its own subfield of AI. Um, and you know, my goal is that maybe like we have natural language processing right now. In a few years, we'll have a whole subfield of planetary data processing. So, uh, you know, what we're really focused on is creating uh, what I call AI for the digital planet. And by that, I mean creating these tools that give society the ability to use AI to rapidly understand and assess our world and translate these massive data sets into insights that decision makers and stakeholders can use uh, and that they need to make more informed decisions and predictions about uh, our present and future. And in particular, um, this is so relevant for agriculture and food security uh, in the work that we're doing with the NASA Harvest Program. So uh, I want to start with a story about uh, an example of how at Harvest we've used machine learning to turn these data into insights for decision makers. Um, and this is a project that we did in the West African country of Togo. Um, back in early 2020 uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic to support farmers here. So um, we were contacted by the Togolese uh, government, in particular Chino Lawson, um, who was a, the Minister of Post Digital Economy and Technological Innovation in Togo because they were launching a program where they wanted to uh, distribute aid and, and resources to farmers uh, smallholder farmers in the country to help um, help them cope with the impacts to their livelihoods from the pandemic, um, including you know, supply chain issues that we're all very familiar with now. And so what they wanted to know in particular was how could they distribute funds across all of their voting districts based on the smallholder farmer population in each of those districts. But they didn't have uh, a data set of what that smallholder farmer population was in each of these districts. So they had some records from voting records or census records, but they weren't complete uh, for the number of smallholder farmers because many people uh, farming is their secondary occupation. So this this probably was not uh, reported by many people that they were actually um, engaged in smallholder farming. And so uh, the question from us was, could we use satellite data to map the distribution of the smallholder farms in the country as a proxy for the population of smallholder farmers in each of those districts? And by the way, could we do this by Friday? <laughs> you know, they wanted this in a matter of like five days of, to be able to support this program. And no, they did not have any labeled data that could be shared with us to, to help train a machine learning model. And so this sounds like an impossible task to many people, uh, I'm sure, that are engaged in, in machine learning or with observations. But um, 
we were able to do it. Our team did this um, not quite in five days. I think we took 10 days, but still uh, we made it happen. And in particular, a, a shout out to uh, Gabriel Sang, who's uh, the uh, also the first author on this paper cited here, um, who really made this happen uh, as well. And so using these correlations between the satellite observations and the ground-based observations, we could train a model to predict where crops were growing all over Togo at high resolution and with high accuracy and deliver this map to the Togolese government in under 10 days. And um, Chena Lawson had this to say about the map that we delivered. She said, this map provides unmatched clarity into the nature and distribution of agricultural land nationwide and helps provide decisive knowledge being used to design social protection policies aimed at improving the livelihoods of agrarian rural communities. And so uh, we, to develop tools and technologies that allow our team to respond to requests like this one in Togo, uh, we focus on some key research areas in, in terms of the kinds of technologies we're developing. So I'll talk about some examples of these three areas in this talk. But developing realistic data sets and benchmarks, learning from limited labeled data, and scalable deployment of machine learning models. So starting with data sets, the reason we focus on this topic is that commonly used benchmarks in or benchmark data sets in machine learning like ImageNet or COCO do not look like the real world. And so performance on these benchmarks is not really indicative of how these models will perform on real world tasks. And in particular, for Earth observation data, we have all kinds of data challenges, uh, such as high intra-class variance. So we have, we have a lot of variability within each of our classes that we want to predict, such as crop types, low inter-class variance. So many classes look, have a lot of overlap, can look very similar to each other, especially on a global scale. Um, often we have multiple labels uh, for a given sample, so many fields, especially in small motor agriculture, have multiple crops growing in them. These labels are not static in time, they're changing from year to year as farmers might plant different kinds of crops or land cover changes or land use changes. Uh, the data are very noisy. Uh, both our data and our labels, you can see this example GIF here of, um, of a time series of satellite images and you see these annoying things called clouds that often get in the way and have to be um, dealt with in our machine learning models. Um, and uh, acquiring labels for uh, these problems is also difficult. We can't usually just look at an image uh, from a satellite and tell you, you know, what type of crop should be the label in a particular field. We have to actually go out on the ground and find these. Um, and we, we very much violate the uh, IID assumption of independently and identically distributed uh, samples uh, because we have the spatial data, but we also have very imbalanced data sets. Um, you know, we might have a lot of data from one part of the world, not a lot in another. We might have a lot of data for one crop and not another, um, and various challenges like this. So this, this picture here shows an example of a field that's intercropped with banana, cassava, and maize. I think this was in Uganda. So, you know, imagining trying to sort that out from a pixel and a satellite image is a, a significant challenge. So our workflow for developing machine learning technologies for agriculture and food security monitoring with earth observations data looks kind of like this. So we start with the data set of our ground truth observations paired with the corresponding satellite observations we train our machine learning models, and then their outputs can result in products like cropland or crop type maps, crop conditions, yield. These are the kinds of uh, main things that we're trying to predict with our machine learning models from satellite data. And in particular, getting these crop type labels, um, as I mentioned before, is a huge challenge, um, not just for agriculture, but for pretty much all uh, applications involving machine learning and earth observation. So this is a big focus that we have. And um, one of the things that we're doing is creating new benchmark data sets uh, that are more representative of how models will perform on these particular tasks, you know, keeping them relevant to the tasks that we need to solve in these uh, agricultural problems. 
so that the accuracy on these evaluation tasks actually reflects how they might perform um, in a deployed scenario. Um, but also, you know, trying to, to get them in the format and, and the um, using APIs that researchers in machine learning are used to so we can try to bridge these communities and stimulate uh, more research in this area. Um, and also, you know, make make tools that we need in our group to be able to do this rapid response work. So an example of this is the crop harvest data set, uh, which is a growing global data set for crop type mapping, um, which we published in the NeurIPS data and benchmarks track last year, has over 90,000 labels from 300, almost 350 agricultural classes. We unified over 20 data sets to create this. And so for all of these ground truth observations, which are points that you see here on this map, for all of these labels for either a uh, cropland or a binary label, or a multi-class label for the crop type, we also have a time series of satellite observations for that location um, from four different satellite data sources uh, that you can see here. And we have these evaluation tasks that are um, meant to be diverse over the different kinds of challenges that we see in these problems, um, which we've, we've defined these tasks in Kenya, Brazil, and in Togo. Um, and so this, this has also been used as a challenge in um, various conferences and um, like Kaggle challenges as well. And so global data sets like crop harvest were a critical part of our solution that we developed for Togo, because while we could only find 58 labels within Togo, there were tens of thousands available elsewhere in the world. So by using this very large data set of global samples to augment our much smaller data set of labels that were available in Togo, um, we could uh, make use of all of, these, all of these labels to still be able to train a model that could perform well in Togo by um, helping the model learn what cropland looks like generally all over the world. So even though we have this very large data set of you know, nearly 100,000 agricultural labels in crop harvest, this still isn't enormous by machine learning terms, um, but they're also not uniformly distributed across the globe as we saw in Togo. So um, our publicly available data sets are more sparse and uh, heterogeneous in some parts of the world than in others. So for example, in France, we have this very nice, well annotated, extremely large data set of parcel uh, field boundaries and crops that are growing that is produced by the government on I think nearly an annual basis. But uh, in Kenya and Tanzania, we have these much more sparse and variable quality labels. And in many countries, we don't have any labels at all. And in part, this is because getting these labels is really difficult. It's expensive. It's a lot of work. You know, you literally have to like walk out into a field with a, a phone or some device to record the location, record data. It's very slow and, and not scalable. And so um, we are developing a solution that we call Street to Sat that really tries to, or we're trying to completely you know, transform the way that we're collecting ground truth data traditionally and um, really automate this process uh, in a lot of ways. And so what we're doing here is turning roadside images of crops into ground truth labels that can be paired with satellite data. So we start by uh, using GoPros mounted on motorbike helmets and on cars. Uh, to collect geotagged and time tagged images on the uh, of fields on the sides of roads. And then we're using object detection methods to detect uh, if crops are growing in the image, where they are and which types of crops are growing. And then we use uh, depth estimation techniques to estimate how far away that crop is in the image so that we can move the location of the label from the road on the camera to the actual crop uh, inside the field. And then from this, we can pair our, our predicted crop type with our new location to get these georeference crop type labels. And using this approach, we can cover a much, much, much larger area like this path that you see here that we took um, in a pilot uh, test of this in Uganda, where we were able to cover almost all of the main growing regions in the country in under a week. 
which would be completely impossible with the traditional approach of data collection. Um, and you can imagine we're collecting, we're actually collecting images every half second uh, when these cameras are on. So there are millions of images being collected using this approach. And so we need a scalable way of processing images. So we've developed um, this cloud-based pipeline where um, as soon as images are uploaded from the GoPro data collection into uh, Google Cloud Storage, we automatically have a trigger function that calls uh, Cloud Run in Google Cloud, creates a Docker container with our optimized version of our uh, object detection model for crop types using um, that with a model served with TorchServe. And then uh, we put these predictions in another bucket uh, that mirrors that structure of the unlabeled bucket. And then we can uh, do our distance estimation on the areas of interest to get our final crop type label for a region of interest. And using this uh, pipeline, we've been able to process over a million images. I think it's actually over 3 million images now. This might be a bit out of date. Uh, in several countries, including the US, uh, US, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. So, um, you know, even though we are trying to create more labeled data sets here and, and make uh, create more access to large labeled data sets for agriculture and, and crop type in particular, um, we still have a challenge of needing to learn efficiently from these labels. Uh, because really, we won't necessarily ever have enough labels for a given task. And especially in places where we don't have a lot of this labeled data, um, for example, in uh, smallholder dominated regions like in Sub Saharan Africa, um, it's really important to be able to create models that perform as well as these other locations where we do have a lot of data by creating models that can learn from limited labels. And one way that we can get a model to learn more efficiently could be by giving the model prior contextual information about what it's going to be learning. So for example, uh, if a model or a person knows the location of um, a sample and knows where it's looking at fields from, then this might help uh, to learn more quickly what type of crop might be going, growing there, uh, what the growing season is, things like that. So for example, crops between the US and France look much more similar uh, to each other than they do to crops in Kenya or Mali, and, and vice versa. Crops in Kenya and Mali look more similar to each other um, than crops in some other regions. And similarly, some crops may only be grown at certain latitudes. So you know, if you are, if the model knows that it is trying to predict coffee or some type of you know, tropical um, crop, then it knows that um, its, its prediction or, or the probability of that growing in a region outside of those boundaries should be low. Um, so giving this information to models that we have already as metadata in these earth observation data would be very useful. So in the case of Togo, we use multitask learning to communicate this regional context to, uh, of each of the training samples to the model. So in, in that model, we learn shared features in the network from both the global and local samples, but our final classification layer branches depending on whether the training sample is from Togo or some other place in the world. And so by having this uh, kind of region-specific uh, branching or multitask learning, we can encourage the model to learn features that are useful for detecting cropland in general, but focus more on those patterns that are more important for agriculture in Togo. And we do that by penalizing the model more for getting Togo examples wrong uh, than for getting examples from elsewhere in the world wrong during training. Another approach that we've developed for enabling models to learn contextual information is called task-informed meta-learning or TIML. So with TIML, we construct our tasks for meta-learning by stratifying the crop harvest data set by country and by crop. So we end up with tasks like maize versus rest in Kenya. And the goal of TIML is to improve learning efficiency by commuting, communicating to the model what type of task it's going to learn. And by doing this, we can move the weights closer to the optimal weights for that task before training for that task even begins. So this can enable the model to learn, for example, which months in the input 12 month time series should be 
uh, highlighted or suppressed based on the growing season for different crops in different countries. And so we pass this information to the model by creating a task information vector, which is a 13 dimensional vector where three of the uh, values are a representation of the latitude and longitude of that uh, label location. And the remaining coordinates are a one high encoding of uh, the high level kind of crop category. So is it learning, uh, is it trying, is, is the sample a cereal crop or is it, uh, is the task a cereal crop? Is the task uh, for beverage crops or, or uh, legumes, something like that. Um, and importantly, unlike the satellite data that is changing for every single data point, this task information vector is constant across all of the data points within a given task. Where a task again is something like uh, predicting maize versus rest in Kenya. So we then use this task information vector to train a separate encoder network that learns the tasks embeddings that we use to modulate the hidden vectors of our classifier before uh, our, our inner loop uh, training or task fine tuning begins in this meta learning setup. And when we visualize the learn embeddings for our tasks using uh, TSNE for dimensionality reduction, we can see that the embeddings for tasks in the serial category, for example, like wheat and maize, are closer to each other than they are to other categories like vegetables. And there are also clear geographic clusters within these category clusters as well. So for example, we see these uh, blue clusters of, of tasks from Africa and green clusters of tasks from Europe. So we evaluated TIML using the benchmark tasks from crop harvest and found that TIML outperformed all of our compared baselines um, and also outperformed the baselines for uh, yield estimation for predicting soybean yields in the US. And this, I just want to highlight, you know, this is very useful for agriculture, but it's not only useful for agriculture. Um, so this could be used for any, um, any problem where you have some metadata that the model could learn prior information from. So for things like species distribution modeling or for fine grain image classification, this could be useful as well. For example, uh, an image is more likely to have a label like European toad if the image was taken in Europe uh, and you have that metadata from the image. So now that we have models like TIML or the multitask learning model that have been trained and we show we can perform well for these experimental data sets that we report in our papers, we want to actually deploy them for use in the real world to serve our end user and stakeholder needs in NASA Harvest, like the Togolese government. And uh, this is kind of the, the workflow that we generally have for machine learning and remote sensing, um, where we gather our remote sensing data set and we train our machine learning model, but deployment looks like creating a map. So typically we want to use this model to predict uh, over all the entire area of a country to predict a map. And unfortunately, most of the work in the literature usually concludes at this point of uh, training the model and evaluating it on some uh, sparse, hopefully held out data set. Um, but where the work should actually conclude is that at this end point of using that model to create a map. Um, and that's because that's really our end goal. And a lot of work doesn't do this because it's very time and cost intensive uh, using traditional approaches to create that map. And so in other words, stopping at this experimental evaluation is really an incomplete task. So where our goal is to have this dense prediction, this dense set of predictions that form a map when we're, um, when we're evaluating on a sparse data set of, of test samples, um, you know, these are just barely kind of sampling the, the whole area, the map that uh, we eventually want to create. Um, and what we really want is to get something like this, where we use our trained model to make this dense prediction uh, that forms a map. This is fundamentally different than the setup that we're used to in machine learning, typically, where we might have a task like image segmentation, and we train a model on a very large data set, but then at the time of serving or deployment, we're predicting on more sparse, uh, usually independent samples. Uh, and on the other hand, with remote sensing, it's kind of flipped. So our data sets for training tend to be much smaller, 
Um, but inference is actually very computationally intensive. And if we're trying to use this to predict way, way, way more um, samples at inference time. So really we need a way to do this dense inference in an efficient and scalable way. And it's important that we go this extra step of dense geospatial prediction, even in our research studies, not just if we're trying to deploy the model, because skipping dense predictions has some important consequences. So number one, this can deter adoption by the intended end users. If they're not able to actually use the model to generate a map efficiently, then it's not really useful to the end users. Uh, number two, it can obfuscate failure modes. So for example, uh, the map on the right has a lower F1 score than the map on the left. So based on our traditional machine learning metrics, we might think the model that produced the map on the left is better. But when we actually look at the map that comes out of this, we see these different spatial artifacts that are not um, captured by our traditional metrics. And finally, dense geospatial prediction would actually stimulate a lot of really interesting research and foundational topics in machine learning, like domain shift, evaluating on unlabeled data, and other topics. So to address this gap and make our own machine learning model deployment more scalable for serving harvest end users, we developed a Python library called OpenMathFlow that enables rapid map creation with machine learning and Earth observation data. And open map flow is designed to reduce that time and cost required for rapidly creating a map once you have that trained machine learning model. And inside open map flow, we have the code, we have example collab notebooks, data versioning and model versioning, a cloud architecture for deployment, uh, all kind of encapsulated in some of these uh, example projects. And OpenMapflow actually spans the entire project development lifecycle, not just the serving piece. So it goes all the way from setting up a new project, uh, preparing the satellite data, getting that satellite data associated with some labels, uh, training models and evaluating them. At this point, you can use any model um, very readily. That's from the TSAI uh, library, really any model that is in PyTorch, um, you would be able to use here and uh, also then goes all the way to providing the infrastructure for serving the model. And this is available right now. You can pip install this and, and get started using it yourself. And we have several demo projects um, on the GitHub as well to help you get started for agriculture use cases, but also other use cases like building mapping. So the, these are our technology focus areas, but we also have two people focus areas, which are very critical for helping make this work possible, um, which are number one, we have a diverse team of researchers from different backgrounds and disciplines. We would not be able to do this as a single discipline group. Um, you know, it's very important that as machine learning researchers, we have uh, very close collaboration um, and, and uh, co-development with experts uh, from agriculture and remote sensing, as well as our end users. And I also want to highlight in particular uh, Ivan Zvonkov and Gabrielle Sang here, who uh, are students that led a lot of the work in the projects that I talked about in these slides. And secondly, we have a huge focus on uh, participatory development and capacity boosting from end users and uh, local experts in the regions that we're working in from the very beginning uh, to help set the priorities for the technologies we're developing, make sure we're developing technologies that will be usable in practice and also make sure that we're handing those technologies over and, you know, uh, making sure that people and country are, are able to do this themselves and it's not really siloed with us. So um, all of these, uh, I, I hopefully, hopefully I've showed in this talk so far how uh, by focusing on these different areas, we can conduct use inspired AI research that actually has impact on real world problems uh, like global agriculture and food security um, through these priorities that we're focusing on through NASA Harvest and help to um, uh, deliver uh, projects like this one in Togo that I talked about. So I will turn over to Inbal now to share her screen for talking about um, a specific use case that is ongoing now in Harvest for uh, rapid response to support 
uh, agricultural assessments in Ukraine. Great. Thanks very much, Hannah. Let me just. Okay, hopefully everybody can see um, my my slides. I, for some reason, continue to have a black screen. Um, but I'd first like to highlight that the work that Hannah and her team are doing is absolutely fundamental and a real enable, enabler for much of the work we do across all of our focus areas within NASA Harvest. Um, I'm going to talk specifically now about um, one of uh, the projects that we have that we've been working a lot on, in, uh, particularly in assessing the impact of the war in Ukraine due to the invasion of Russia. Um, and I'd like to uh, upfront acknowledge a large and diverse team that's been working really around the clock in support of the Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food in Ukraine. And so probably most of you are well aware of the importance of Ukraine to global food supplies. Um, many countries are reliant on production from Ukraine and agriculture plays a critical role also within Ukraine's economy. And so if we look more specifically, prior to the war, Ukraine was responsible for over 40% of global sunflower oil exports, about 16% of corn and around 10% of wheat exports. And with countries like Lebanon almost completely reliant on Ukraine for their wheat supplies. And on the World Food Program side, they source about 40% of their wheat for food aid also from Ukraine. And so um, shortly after Russia invaded Ukraine, we formalized our partnership with the Ministry of Agrarian Policy and, and Food, building on a long-standing partnership that we've had with several different entities in Ukraine, including the Hydromet Center, Kiev Polytechnique, um, and the Ministry and, and others. And what the Ministry asked us to specifically focus on was estimating the impact of the war on agriculture in the Russian-controlled territory, where ground data was not available. And also in the longer term, they um, have asked us to help to boost the ministry's existing capacity for their use with uh, satellite data. So the first thing we sought to do was to assess where and how much winter crops were planted. Um, remember, winter crops primarily is, is winter wheat is planted, was plant, is planted in the fall. So that was planted prior to the beginning of the war. And then where spring and summer crops could potentially be planted. Um, and ultimately, what we wanted to, to do was to be able to estimate how much of Ukraine's croplands were under Russian control. So to do this, we established two critical partnerships, one with the ESA World Cereals Project, um, the other with, with Planet, and, actually, and a third one actually with the Institute for the Study of War. So why, why did we form a partnership with Planet? Um, for those of you not familiar, Planet is a commercial satellite provider, but they provide three meter resolution data globally on a daily basis. Um, and so Ukraine was very, very cloudy. And so here I'm looking at some of the Sentinel data, so publicly open available data across one area in Ukraine and in, in, in Poltava. And you see all white, and all of that white are clouds. When we talked to Planet and looked at the same period for over the same region, um, this is what the image looked like as a two-week composite, right? And so what a composite is, if you think about almost a puzzle, every time you have an area that didn't have a cloud, you take that in and, and you build up this, this composite, right? So, so that was... Um, the first thing we, we did, and then we look at these through both spectrally and through time because agriculture changes very rapidly, as a lot of what you've seen from, from uh, what Hannah presented, and therefore having capturing both the, uh, those aspects is very important. And so similar to, to the story that Hannah started with about Togo, we had no ground labels, and we needed to produce an in-season map actually fairly early on within the season um, that could identify where the winter crops had been planted and where spring and summer crops could be planted. And so while we didn't have ground data, we did have a lot of domain knowledge about how croplands are in, in, in particular wheat in Ukraine. And so we ultimately went with a K-means classification using time series data from these planet composite and produced this map. And based on this map, what you see here are also the front lines at, at the time from, from ISW. Um, we could then compute or estimate how much area was under Russian control. And, and I'll talk a little bit more, but it's really important when we make these kinds of maps, we can't just go to every you know, pixel that we have classified as, as a particular crop and add all those up and get at an area because, again, as you all know, we have a lot of biases. We have a lot of, we can have errors in, in, in our maps and so those will get aggregated up. And so we do do uh, statistical sampling based on these maps. Um, but ultimately what we see then is that the percent of total uh, cropland that was under occupation was around 22, 23%. 
and the percent of um, wheat under Russian control was around 29%. And here we're breaking that out. The blue is Ukrainian control. The gray is uh, previously occupied, so that's Donbass in, in Crimea. And then the orange is the newly occupied territories. And this actually ended up getting quite a lot of um, media and, and also was very helpful actually for the ministry itself to be able to start to understand how much area was actually um, under Russian control. Now, as the season progressed, we could we, we took a hierarchical approach in, into our, our mapping. So we first classified the winter crops. Rapeseed, this is an oil seed, both used for um, bioethanol but, and also for oil, for, for cooking oil. And so what you see, these kind of really bright green fields, that's rapeseed when it's flowering. So canola, other people might think about it as uh, canola, it's the same crop. Um, and so that's yellow, that's what it looks like. And so we're able to then capture and classify Again, all these at the three meter resolution across the whole country. And that is after it flowers around middle of May. We also delineated all the field boundaries across the entire country. And together, when we combined our um, pixel based map with the field boundaries, we can get a fairly clean map of uh, classified, classified fields, which is our ultimate measure of uh, unit of measure. So there were two really important key unknowns that we sought to address with satellite data. One was how much area would be planted to spring and summer crops. Spring and summer crops are, remember, are the sunflower, the corn, uh, soybeans. And secondly, how much of the winter wheat that had been planted before the war would be harvested. Now, what we all saw in the media and in official reports was that the assumption was going to be that anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of summer crops would not be planted um, because of the war and similarly would not be harvested. And, and there was good reason, right? It, Farmers fled their fields. There was a lot of uh, damage to fields. A lot of fields have been bombed. A lot of machinery had been destroyed. Fertilizer was not available. Diesel was not available. But when we started to look, and this is an example from Herson, um, uh, what you see here on the, the green are the fields that were already planted to winter crops. And through time, what we see here are the fields as they're getting planted. And what we observed is that actually the majority of the fields were being cultivated, were being planted. And so if we looked at then um, what was left unplanted, right? And so we, we then were, um, this is zooming out to the country, all the gray areas here are croplands, all these little brown dots that you see, and, and here you have a zoom in as to what that actually looks like. Those are the fields that were left unplanted. And what we notice is, yes, there's a lot of fields that are unplanted. Yes, un, you know, un, not surprisingly, they're concentrated in the occupied territories. And they're also actually concentrated around the front line. And when we look at it, this is a graph looking at that. These are binned at 10 kilometers. The blue is a reference line of the front line. So going to the left is in distance going towards Russia within the occupied territories, going to the right is into Ukrainian controlled territories. And what we see is a concentration of unplanted fields is close to the, to the front line on, on both sides of, of the front line. Okay, so as the season progresses, we can add other classes to our, initially we were just looking at was this planted or not to spring crops. We um, then also map sunflower fields. And those are these light blue fields now that you're seeing in here. I'm zoomed into an area just south of Zaporizhia and you see the, the front line in, in red. But when we zoom out, and so that yellow box is what I was zoomed into before. When you zoom out, something quite, we see something quite striking is all those little blue dots are our sunflower in 2022. And we see that if you look around the front line. Again, we see this whole area that's not being planted, but for the rest, they're actually planting a lot of sunflower. And there was a lot of incentive to plant sunflower because it's less energy um, consuming. So corn has to be generally dried after it's harvested. Um, and, and there was a, a price incentive as well for, for oilseed crops. So, so we do see a lot of sunflower. And again, if we compare this to 2021 map of sunflower, you see that the sunflower comes all the way up to those areas in, in the front line. For some reason, my slide is not meant. To. Okay, so this is ultimately our um, classification map for all of Ukraine. Again, at three meter resolution, this is the first time um, that planet data had been used to map an entire country. Um, our, while we didn't have ground data, we, we did um, get actually ground data afterwards from a team uh, that's led by Natalia Kusil from Kiev Polytechnic University, um, only from the three Ukraine or the Ukrainian controlled territories. Um, but our accuracy of our map was overall about 94%, which was really good given that we had no ground data from the country. So again, we can then update these, these um, 
proportions of, of crop planted croplands that were under Russian occupation. We now see that summer crops, around 21% of summer crops are under Russian occupation, and around 14% of the rapeseed is, is under occupation. We also know that then Ukraine liberated a significant amount of area, in particular around the Kharkiv region. And what that translated into is around 3.6% of the winter wheat area and around 2.5% of overall croplands. And so um, we, in order to build some confidence in what we're doing and for the ministry to build confidence in, in what we were seeing, which was very different from the reports that they had, um, was to compare our area estimates uh, for the winter cereals. Again, these had been planted before the war. They had uh, good statistics on these, especially in, 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 uh, in the Ukrainian controlled territories minus Donbass and, and Crimea. And our numbers are pretty close to theirs, right? And so that builds the confidence in what we're seeing in the occupied territories where we have really no ground data to be able to validate um, with. And, um, and so then our next question was gonna be, so now we have some estimates in terms of what had been planted. Um, what's going to be harvested? Again, a lot of reports saying anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the wheat was not going to be harvested, in particular in the in the occupied territories. And our results showed something different. And so we spend actually a lot of time working with the ministry and showing them what is the satellite data actually being able to show us. And so I'm going to take you through this very quickly. Um, this is a time series uh, visually of of a field in Kherson and the occupied territories. You see it in the in that first image on, on the left. It's right when it's coming out of winter dormancy, right? And it's, so it's this lighter green. You see it a, a good condition, a healthy, strong crop around flowering phase um, in June. You see it start to senesce, right? So wheat, as it dries out, goes brown. And that's why you see this dimmer green. And then you see this kind of, all the, it turn into this bright yellow. And what that is, is once the wheat is harvested, um, it, the residue is left on the field, as you see in this photo. And so we see the, the harvest is complete by around the, the 18th. And then we see again this the tilling, the preparation for the next season. And so the tilling is complete um, by the end of July. So now if we just visually zoom back out to Ukraine, we have the front line. The Remember, the, the wheat is planted primarily in the south and in the, the eastern parts of the country. What we see, you, you now see this kind of a bright brown. That's all the fields that are being harvested, except for you see a darker area again around the front line. And if I zoom in um, to one of these areas, again, this is everything that's green primarily with a winter crop here. This is a May image. If I flip to um, a late July image, you see that everything is getting harvested, including in the occupied territories. And we do, of course, see this darker area around the front line. And so we were able to then, again, through time, classify our, the, the harvested fields as they progressed. And ultimately, this is these, what is left non-harvested is represented by these blue dots. You can see the two front lines that, that shifted um, after a, a, a large area was liberated. But again, the, the large majority of the area that hadn't been harvested was around the front line. And we even saw, so again, uh, I'll just emphasize briefly, we use these maps to then be able to run random stratified samples. And that's what our est statistical estimates are actually based on. And so when we go and validate these visually with daily data from, from Planet, what we see is some of these fields, this is a field, if you, if you look carefully, that has a lot of little white dots. This is a field that's actually been shelled. Um, the tanks are often sitting in these tree lines between the, the fields and, 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 and firing. And you can see machinery being driven through the field. You see the field senesce, and ultimately we actually see that field also being harvested. So we even saw a fair number of fields that had been shelled that are still being harvested. So ultimately our analysis found that 89% of wheat fields in the occupied territories were harvested, much, much higher than most everybody had expected and was reporting. And so what that meant was when we put out our estimate of what ultimately production was from Ukraine, our number is much higher than most of the official numbers coming out. So our number is around 26.8 million tons of, of wheat. Um, I won't go into detail. We also estimate yields for Ukraine. And so the harvested area times the yield is what ultimately gives us production. And if we looked at how much wheat was produced and, and harvested from the occupied territories, it's around 5.85 million tons, which translates to about 22% of Ukraine's harvested wheat. And if we very conservatively convert that into how much money that is, that's over a billion, it's around $1.3 billion that are lost just in harvested wheat, right? That's not thinking about the damages and the costs of machinery, of burnt fields, of damage, of polluted fields, et cetera. 
And uh, this is a quote from, from the ministry in terms of how they've been using this data and, and the value that's had for them, again, because a lot of what we were seeing was very different than the reports that they were receiving and, and, and hearing. So this raises a really important question of where is that 22% ending up and who's going to reap ultimately the economic benefits? Now, from the satellite data, we can provide a lot of information. We can see that fields are being cultivated. What we can't see is who's cultivating and who's harvesting these fields, who's purchasing the grain, how much are they paying, where is it being stored, is it being exported? Um, but interestingly, there have been some recent investigative reports. This is one from Bloomberg, one came out recently also from the Financial Times, talking about being able to track and starting to look at what's happening for some of that grain that's coming out of the occupied territories and ultimately ending up being exported um, as Russian grain. So we're also, I'll just briefly say, we're also doing some damage assessments, looking at both fire and unexploded ordnance, um, and, and for and being able to support then demining efforts. Here's a field again that you can see was shelled and then has been um, uh, burnt as well. That, that, that's that, that dark signal. Um, and again, being able to then identify individual craters in fields and then ultimately be able to start to, to map the, the density um, of craters in, in fields around the occupied and the front line in particular. Here's also looking at uh, fires in agricultural fields. And again, you could almost just draw the front line if you would just trace through where we're seeing fires. And right now we're working on being able to, to quantify um, the, the damage due to these. So um, as Hannah has talked about, we have seen in the past few years a tremendous increase in the demand for rapid uh, satellite-driven agricultural assessments, largely in response to market uncertainty of major crop producing, uh, crop producers increasing erratic and extreme weather events, the COVID pandemic, regional conflict, and now the war in Ukraine. And so, what, and we see a real big gap actually in being able to do this, and there's no entity today that's set up to operationally be able to respond to these kinds of requests in real time with remote sensing data, connecting into the socioeconomic data, connecting into trade, connecting into policy, um, and so we are now under Harvest working very hard to set up a, a center around rapid agricultural assessments in support of, of uh, policy. Um, and I think I can't stress enough the importance of this kind of capability. And um, with that, I'll, I'll end our talk and, and thank you very much. And also say that if you're interested in any of this work, please feel free to, to contact us uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Imbal and Hannah, for this uh, yeah absolutely amazing uh, presentation. Uh, we have a few uh, questions in, in the chat. Um, first question that we have is: Is it possible to use lidar data as opposed to photos as input to training models? Um, the advantages of lidar could be that it's not sensible to weather conditions. And Paul, do you want to talk about like LIDAR availability? Yeah, sure. So um, right now we don't have LIDAR data such as, you know, it's, it's sitting on the, the International Space Station. Um, there has actually been coming out of the Stanford group a really important and interesting work on using LIDAR data for mapping corn and looking at that height. Um, but for addressing clouds, we're often using SAR data, so microwave data that's longer wavelengths that can go through clouds, it's very sensitive to structure and to biomass. And so some of the work I showed were actually using SAR data for, especially in terms of the looking at harvested and, and planted area. And then that's very sensitive to, to the, that structural um, of, of crops and, and how they change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and SAR is synthetic aperture radar. So um, often like in our models, we that's one of the data sets that we use in addition to the optical data. And we also include other relevant data sets like um, elevation and slope. Um, you know, certain crops might only grow on uh, at certain elevations or might be more likely to grow on uh, flat slopes, for example, like rice often grows in lowlands. Um, and we also include temperature and precipitation information in our input. And those are all inputs in, in that crop harvest data set that I showed too. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a related question actually. Um, so have you tried using machine learning data pre-processing techniques, like for example, image denoising, to remove the clouds maybe and make your images that you get from the satellite more um, 
more usable for these models that we're using. Um, also, maybe you could use some machine learning models to transform uh, images taken during night to look uh, better. So you can also use them uh, for training these models. Yeah, um, I put this as a as a comment answer too. But um, regarding the the nighttime images, we do have nighttime lights data. I think many people have probably seen that kind of data set. But um, typically. Uh, optical images are taken during the daytime, um, specifically most of these satellites that we're working with um, because of the orbit that they're in, they're taking, it's a sun synchronous orbit. Um, so they're uh, taking images around 1030 a.m. local time um, whenever they're taking them. So there's generally like consistent lighting because it's around the same time. Um, there are also some studies that are using techniques like image denoising um to remove clouds um and also like um in painting kind of techniques uh for filling in clouds uh but the challenge with a lot of these is uh that they're not scalable in terms of applying them over like an entire archive um you know so still a lot of the cloud processing algorithms that are used are just based on the values and certain bands, um, like some satellites have a particular band that is intended to help uh, identify cloudy observations. Like uh, in Landsat, we can use the thermal band or there's a cirrus band for cirrus clouds or different things like that. Um, Cause those are much faster in terms of applying them to, you know, petabytes of data that are being collected by these satellites. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so actually, I just want to make sure. So we have three more questions. Do you have time for for that, uh, Imbal and Hannah? Yeah, I could. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the other question that uh, from Alexandra is: Do you encounter any legislative restrictions for creating a map over some countries? I guess some governments can be against that. That's again an important question. I think the the um, pri the issue of privacy comes up often, and, and you know how do you use it, make sure that the data is being used for good versus not. In the particular case of Ukraine, um, we have an agreement both with Planet Out and with the Ministry that the actual maps that we're producing we will only share with the Ministry of Agriculture. We, we, we cannot share that with, with anybody else, given the sensitivity. What we can share then are the derived information and the statistics. Um, that that we use from that, and so I think it, it um, satellite data, especially from from NASA, from ESA, are free and, and open, so you can map any country in, in in the world, even if a government doesn't necessarily want you to. But I think in terms of ethics and things like that, that obviously is a, an important question for for the whole community, and and I think there's a lot of work on ensuring and how do you ensure and look at what data is being used and how. Right. And, you know, like with, with great power access to data and compute comes great responsibility, you know, and so I think because these technologies have become so much more accessible, it's easier than ever to create a map of anything anywhere. And, you know, our approach at Harvest is that we're uh, like the maps that we're creating or the, the projects that we're working on, we're working with um, people in those countries from the beginning, like we're not, you know, thinking of something that we want to do and just doing it. Like this is based on a, a user or a request that's coming from the country. And so, um, you know, we're working with them directly to create these models and these products. Um, but, you know, I think it's a really important ethical question in terms of also like accuracy assessment, you know, just because you can create a map with a machine learning model um, that can have a lot of implications that somebody publishing a paper or just putting this out online might not realize, um, you know, if you're mapping like sensitive crops or sensitive regions or making claims about, um, you know, uh, causal uh, causes of deforestation or things like that. You know, it's important for us to think about um, what it really means for us to be making these claims from our, our safe places and research or academia. Maybe I'll, I'll just add one more thing to it. And I think both of what Hannah and I showed, I would say almost the majority of time in a lot of the production of these actually goes to being able to validate and estimate the uncertainty of these maps and making sure that what we're giving, we're confident in the numbers that we're giving because they have such important implications. And that's something really, really important for everybody to keep in mind. 
A great question. Uh, I can imagine the data you're working on is also very sensitive in the military context because you're working with satellite images from the front line. So I think uh, it, it, you cannot just share them openly, um, especially if you have uh, military related uh, images on the front line. Yeah. We have another great question from Alex uh, who says, uh, who writes, wonderful work. Uh, besides being a research area of um, great practical impact, I also see all uh, this as very interesting machine learning challenge. Do you have ideas about how to attract the machine learning community uh, to work in these problems with this data and perhaps move on from the typical less practical relevant tasks to these uh, relevant tasks that you're working on? Yeah, as a machine learning researcher working on these problems, you know, this is something I think about a lot. and. There's so much to do, like you said, that it, it's not just, you know, interesting application area. And even like you couldn't take models off the shelf that are published in, in machine learning and just apply them and they would work. You know, there's a lot of really interesting um, pathways to impact, but also really interesting foundational machine learning challenges, like some of the ones that I mentioned. Um, that would be amazing to have more people in the community working on and as I said, I really see Earth observation as being, or, or satellite data, remote sensing data as being another modality of uh, machine learning, computer vision, AI. Like we have image data, we have video data, we have language data, we also have satellite data, um, these geospatial data. So, um, you know, I hope that we continue to grow this research community in this field. And um, to help do that, part of, you know, a lot of what we're doing is trying to create these publicly accessible tools, um, Python libraries, as well as data sets um, that are plugged into the machine learning community and being used as challenge data sets at our top conferences and things like that. Um, we also, I, I put the link in the comment for this, but we, we did a tutorial on machine learning, computer vision for remote sensing data. Uh, especially for agriculture at CBPR this year. And all of that material is publicly available online at that link. So that can be also kind of a getting started guide for machine learning researchers who want to explore this work. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. And I think, you know, doing talks like this and getting the word out there in terms of what we're doing and the impact that we're doing and making sure that we have mixed teams of machine learning and agriculture and policy um, and satellite and, and remote sensing backgrounds, I think together that's how we move forward and really make an impact and make sure that we're bridging across siloed or traditionally more siloed communities. And so Hannah, I can say, has been a tremendous translator for, for me between the computer science communities and remote sensing communities and trying to understand what are capabilities, where can we push the, the boundaries and, and where can we go? Maybe to continue on that, actually, you mentioned that satellite images are just one modality. So how important is it actually to incorporate other modalities for these models, like prior information about geolocation, but also maybe weather conditions? Have you tried doing that? Yeah, so we actually do include um, weather information, inter at least precipitation and temperature, um, and some other data sets that are geospatially um, tagged or geospatially referenced uh, as inputs to our models. Um, there's some work on multimodal learning, but this is still like very early. I think there's a lot of really interesting work to be done with um, learning from multiple modalities at the same time. Um, we kind of, uh, we use other modalities that have been mapped onto like a similar format uh, in terms of th that the satellite data sets are so that we can include them basically as additional inputs into our model or additional image bands, or we treat them as images. Um, but yes, that, that is a helpful input and something that I think is increasingly um, studied in, in this research space. Thank you. Oh, okay, so there are like very different questions. I will try to combine them. <laughs> Um, so the first one is on, um, so you work with smallholder far farmers, uh, how do you deal with things such as intercropping, you know, crop segmentation and classification tasks? And I think somehow we can relate it to the other question about um, images from regions near uh, frontline for the project that you present presented, uh, which can differ a lot from images that you're usually working with. 
uh, how do you fine tune ML models for these regions? Um, I think maybe the uh, question that ties both of these points is uh, like, when do you determine, uh, you know, what is a, a specific local context for which you have to incorporate, I don't know, specific underground uh, information that may be difficult to acquire? Um, like, for example, no one's going to go to the front line to actually uh, acquire data or like you might not be able to visit uh, all these small uh, holder farms that have like specific practices because it's very costly. Um, like, are there ways that you like assess this and um, yeah, what are ways to? Well, I will say that um, everywhere is different and like there is pretty much never a region where we're like, oh, we just take this model that we have and like we make the predictions that it's done, you know, like we are always having to do some um, adaptation to the local conditions. And, you know, the way that we try to address this is by developing these core tools and methods and even workflows, um, just of like how we go about uh, creating these projects that can allow us to really efficiently adapt and, and have the, the kind of uh, language in our models to be able to adapt to these different conditions um when we go to different places because you know uh, trying to take a global approach to doing this work is not really effective at the scale of the analysis like at individual field scales that we're working on um and so our approach really is like a bottom up where like we're trying to develop these reusable systems and workflows um that we can use to quickly uh create a solution and adapt to a new region rather than creating you know one model that's globally applicable which is really just um infeasible and ineffective um but yeah Inval, do you have anything you want to add to that no I, I agree with that and i think um you know even if you look at the same place but one year to the next the seasons could have been a really dry season and you know so that's going to look also very different and i think it's always really critical, therefore, to have really good knowledge of the place you're working, of what are the things that are driving, and having also the, the local expertise for those countries to, to be able to work in, in those. And, and that helps to really also logic assess is what I, I'm saying is what I'm doing, making sense in terms of what we know and being able to, to adapt what we're doing. Yeah, and making sure that we're designing our experiments when we're evaluating our models that we're accounting for like the expected kinds of domain shift that we might see like from an unseen year or an unseen region, you know, we test how well the model generalizes to out of distribution in terms of time and in terms of space and in terms of you know, the various dimensions that we encounter in um, deploying these models. Yeah, um, great. Thanks uh, for your answer. I think we have our last question uh, for today, which is from Anna writes amazing amazing work uh if one would do, want to work on projects like this uh where could one go to are there hubs uh, somewhere where this research is focused maybe there are conferences we have workshops maybe on at new york yeah so i would say at almost every one of the main conferences uh in machine learning these days there's some um workshop that is relevant to uh, agriculture or geospatial. So one really big one is the Earth Vision uh, workshop at CBPR. I mentioned we did a tutorial also at CBPR. Um, at NeurIPS and at iClear, you know, there's the Tackling Climate Change with AI workshop um, that has a lot of, uh, of work that's related to what we're discussing here. There's also a humanitarian mapping workshop that happens at KDD. Um, we've proposed a machine learning for remote sensing workshop for iClear, so stay tuned if we uh, be great to see many of you in Kigali for that. Um, yeah, on the on the machine learning side, but Inval, do you want to say anything about these communities on um, outside of machine learning too? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say in, in specifically if you're interested in, in, you know, there's a lot of work and, and quick recognition by policy communities of the importance of this kind of work and, and what potential remote sensing has. So I would say, broadly speaking, there are a lot of different groups working on this kind of work. It's specifically for Harvest, feel free to contact Hannah and I as well. We often have 
openings or internships or, or different opportunities within Harvest as well. Okay, well, thank you, Embo and Hannah, for having been like so generous with your time and for this like very, very inspiring uh, talk. Thanks a lot also from my side. Uh, hope to see you uh, during the upcoming workshops at New York also um, in person. Um, yeah. So yeah, and thank you to everyone uh, in the audience who attended. Uh, please like go to our website, aihelpsukraine.cc to keep up with uh, all the other uh, amazing rest of the program that we have for the conference. And uh, we'll also post like more details about the increase in event soon. And uh, please continue to support our cause. Uh, and please, sorry for the technical issues that we had today. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining this. And see you next week. Uh, next week, we have Max Welling on Monday, so stay tuned. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.